This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. We're back. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm at Unsiloed. And today I'm with uh, Liam Vaughn, who is uh, an investigative reporter at Bloomberg and also the author of two excellent books. Um, this one here is the latest. It's called Flash Crash. And we'll probably spend most of the time talking about, about this book. But then there's another book which you co-authored, which I really enjoyed. Uh, which is called The Fix, which is uh, one of the best uh, kind of um, reports of um, uh, LIBOR and how LIBOR was was hacked and, um, you know, how that whole thing unraveled. And I think we're still kind of feeling the effects of that. We haven't really sorted out how we're going to um, think about those markets. But why don't we get started uh, talking about um, a Flash Crash, and then we'll talk a little more about kind of, you know, how you came to this story, how you've uh, been doing your reporting and, um, you know, what are the next stories that you're interested in? I, I actually found that in this book, the, the, there are a bunch of side stories that were, um, at least as interesting as the main story and which s could serve as fodder for, you know, a whole bunch of, of other, other books. Um, and so let's get started by, by talking about, uh, you know, Nav Sarau and how did you first come to, um, uh, know about about him. What drove you to write this book? Uh, and um, you know, were you thinking about it right at the moment of the of? Were you thinking when the flash crash happened? Were you thinking, hey, this is something that I really need to look into, or did it only occur to you as a major story after the arrest of of Nav Sarau? So I was working as uh, a, a beat reporter, really, at Bloomberg covering finance in London uh, and I think actually when the flash crash happened, I wasn't even at Bloomberg yet. I think I joined in 2011. So that, you know, it was, it was an event that I was aware of as a, as a finance reporter, um, but didn't pay a huge amount of attention to it at the time. Um, and then it was five years later in 2015 when um, there was an arrest of, of a guy called Navinder Singh Sarau uh, who was a, a day trader in London. Um, and, you know, there was an announcement, quite a lot of fanfare from the US Justice Department that they'd finally, you know, got the culprit of, of the flash crash, which had occurred five years earlier. Um, and the story just instantly piqued my, and, and pretty much everyone that does what I do's attention at the time for a number of reasons. One was that, you know, the, the idea that this, guy on his own could potentially have, have um, you know, helped cause this global financial crash just seemed really um, surprising and, and perplexing. And then gradually over time, information about who he was started to emerge. Um, this was a guy who was operating out of his childhood bedroom in his parents' house underneath the, the flight path of Heathrow Airport you know, never really worked at a major financial institution, had taught himself to trade, you know, wore a tracksuit and swore like a sailor. And yet when they arrested him, it was worth $70 million. Um, and, you know, so, so he was just such an unlikely character. It wasn't just that it was one guy that was this thing was being pinned on, but it was this guy that, that made it fascinating. Um, and then as a reporter, you know, you're kind of scrambling around trying to find how you can push the story forward. Every, you know, everyone's doing the same thing. And just by a real stroke of luck, I actually happened to know a guy who used to sit next to Nav when Nav uh, had first started learning to trade at what were called arcades, you know, so a far cry from an investment bank. You're talking more like uh, an internet cafe, really, where they give you some funding and, and, and you learn how to trade. And my friend had sat next to him. And even before he'd become kind of infamous for this event, everyone remembered Nav because he was such a brilliant trader and such a idiosyncratic guy. Um, you know, used to kind of sit there with um, the kind of ear defenders that road users would would use to block out noise and would sit there in you know in a catatonic state for eight hours a day it was just so much better at trading than all of everyone else in the room um so once that you know once i started going down that route you know i really realized that this was a, 
a, a really unusual and a great financial story. Yeah, I think one part of the story is that you know he's 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 kind of like the the last of of the Mohicans in in many ways, um, because the markets have been dominated by uh, algorithmic traders by you know large institutions that engage in high frequency trading. And when I, when I uh, you know I teach courses in finance and you know we've looked at these uh, crashes. Um, whether it's the remember the United Airlines <laughs> fake news crash and you know Obama got shot um, fake news story and the way the way I've always thought about them is as being um, you know just completely driven by the algorithms right so you know an algorithm uh, uh, triggers a trade which then leads to other algorithms uh, triggering trades and so forth and and then the whole thing happens and unwinds uh, without any you know real human agency. Um, and yet here we have a story where um, the authorities are pinning at least kind of the proximate cause of the crash on uh, an individual trader who is uh, making manual trades um, with his mouse, right? Actually, you know, buying and, and selling. Uh, yeah. and, and so that's yeah. kind of, to me, the most surprising part of the whole story is that, you know, you still actually have a, an actual human who is... Uh, you know, making these 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 fairly large trades based on uh, his flow and his instincts and his kind of reading of the of the ladder. Um, to what extent is 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 he kind of uh, you know representative of almost like a, a previous uh, generation of <laughs> of traders? Yeah. I do. I do agree with your characterization of him as the sort of last of the Mohicans, and he almost takes a lot. He takes a stand against the the rise of the HFTs, and ultimately it proves fruitless, and he gets taken down. But for a while, it works. Um, but the thing about Nav and and what I tried to do with the book is that he arrives at exactly the right time because he starts trading in two thousand and three, which is you know the the very beginnings of um, screen-based mass trading. So essentially, you had all the pits in, in the futures markets that closed in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Everything migrated onto screens. But at that point, his competitors were pretty um, rudimentary in their kind of the, the way that they a approached markets and the way they bought and sold. Um, and you know, one one way to think of it is that you had all these guys that were in the pits. Mm -hmm. A lot of them fairly kind of blue collar guys that were great in that hustle and bustle of a kind of physical trading environment, suddenly attempting to kind of buy and sell things very quickly using a mouse. I mean, you have a guy like Nav, who was a, a really brilliant uh, computer gamer, um, incredibly fast thinking, you know, had this amazing sort of a, a mental arithmetic ability. Um, and so for the first few years, you know, he was just taking on these guys and, and was really, really successful. Um, and so, you know, he goes from a standing start essentially in 2003 to by the time he leaves the first arcade in 2008, he's worth $2 million. The following year after the financial crisis had begun, he was worth $12 million. So he was laughing, um, but things started to go uh, south. Um, you know, maybe 2006, 2007, where you start to get real kind of mass arrival of, of HFT in financial markets. Um, and the reason for that is what, what NAB's doing is a form of trading called uh, scalping, um, which is essentially, as you know, as, as I'm sure your listeners will know, but it's essentially trading very, very short horizons. You're, you're essentially looking at all the orders to buy and sell coming into the market, and you're passing that information almost like a computer to, to assess whether statistically you think the market's likely to go up or down. Um, and, you know, to be fair, there was lots more kind of shenanigans and games that used to go on um, at that point in time. Um, and, and Nav's, you know, uh, personal uh, skills and characteristics made him very, very good at that. But no matter how good you are, you know, it's like Gary Kasparov playing chess. No matter how good you are, a machine is going to be better than you eventually. Um, so there's this sort of turning point in the book where he starts to find that it's just harder for him to get the trades. It's harder for him to get out the way of adverse trades. Uh, and it, it just starts to become difficult for him. Uh, and, and what he finds is that other people that are day traders like him, you know, they leave the market or they decide that they're going to try a different strategy, maybe a more long-term strategy. But Nav 
being Nav takes this kind of stance where he's like, no, you know, screw that. I'm going to, uh, you know, he literally says, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, and that was a, you know, a real great moment in reporting the book that I, I stumbled upon his forum posts, which had never been made public. And, and the, the investigators did, weren't even aware of them. And there in black and white, he'd actually sort of made a note where he's like, has anyone noticed how the markets are so unfair these days and how HFT are cheating and spoofing? Uh, and then three days later, he comes back and he says, scrap that, I've decided if you can't beat them, join them. So he essentially builds this algorithm of his own, which is expressly designed to take on the HFTs and to sort of use their um, their features against them, if you like. Yeah, that, that's a great story. I want, I want to back backtrack a bit because, you know, while he might be the last of the Mohicans, he, he, he really replaced a previous type of Mohicans, right? The pit traders. And you have a little side story about them. Uh, you talk about, you know, this, this guy, um, cake bread or what's his cornbread, right? Uh, and he sort of represents yeah. the, the, the really, bread, yeah. really old guard. And, um, and, and I sense that someone like Nav would never have uh, survived in, in a pit environment. It was a very different sort of person that, that thrived in that environment. And then there were different sorts of cues that they would, uh, have to, I mean, he may have had the, the quick wits and the, and the instincts, but there was really a lot of, um, I don't know, physical, social and environmental, um, emo, you know, facial expressions and emotional cues that you had to be able to read in order to survive in that pit environment. And those skills, you know, became useless. I mean, these were athletes for the most part in, in, in the pits. Yeah. What, what could you tell us just a little bit about like, you know, how, how did those, uh, pit environments uh, work from a so sociological perspective. There's a lot of kind of sociology in in your in your book. Yeah, so certainly in the UK, the pits were um, essentially you know started in the 80s and the 90s, and were places where you know people would come together to trade financial futures or commodities or, or, or whatever those securities might be. And essentially you would have, um, you know, a, a central pit where you would have guys wearing jackets representing either different firms or they would trade for themselves. And then round these pits, you would have people on phones inputting orders into, into the pits. Um, and the advantage of this system, which, you know, was effective for its time is that, there was always sort of liquidity. There was always uh, people ready to take the other side of, of trades. Um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, that job, if you like, was done by what were called locals that wore red jackets and they were essentially trading for their own accounts. Um, but in exchange for that, you know, the, these, these individuals uh, would have to take on a lot of risk themselves, but they would get advantages. And the advantages were that they would get to know the brokers mm -hmm. Who were going to place orders and they would be able to you know get in, in ahead of those orders or they would be able to form relationships with with other traders and form allegiances so i, I guess i would describe it as a more informal type of market structure um that actually was quite effective um there wasn't much in the way of, of regulation um you know there, there's this sort of anecdote that keeps coming up which is that if you cheated once you might get away with it if you cheated three times you probably get thrown out and beaten up in the pub after after work so it wasn't the same kind of formalized system it was more like a sort of you know i guess the, a sort of gentleman's type uh approach to, to regulating the markets um and yeah you're, you're absolutely right the people that thrived in that environment were people that were quick thinking, very sociable, were able to form these relationships, but also had a lot of, um, you know, uh, mental fortitude, maybe, you know, could take the kind of ribbing and the cut and thrust of being in that kind of environment, which is incredibly exhausting, you know, for eight or nine hours a day. Um, what what both, the, you know, the later form of trading and, and this form of trading did have in common is you, you do need to be able to have a, a high propensity for to stomach risk. You know, and particularly these red jacketed locals, they are essentially wagering their own money, you know, their, their mortgage money or their holiday money or, you know, their, their you, you know, and, and you have to be able to go in every day. And if the opportunity is right to put that on the line day in and day out. Uh, and that's something that NAV did have, you know, as, as well, 
when it came to electronic trading. Um, but yeah, the difference was when it moved in, in, into screen-based trading, it became faster and it became more about uh, sort of gamesmanship and being able to read your opponents and to react very quickly and to be dexterous. And it almost, yeah, suited those kind of computer game types, uh, at least in the early days. And so but spoofing is something that would be very difficult to do in that pit environment, the way that you could do it in the within the at the anonymity of screen based trading right yeah so so what nav sort of goes on to do when he decides that he's had enough of the h of t firms is that he decides he's going to build this algorithm and essentially it's like a spoofing machine and so if you imagine the h of t at least the sort of form of futures based h of t that i write about in the book Essentially, what you have is like robots <laughs> monitoring order flow, monitoring orders coming and leaving the market, and essentially using very fast technology to try and uh, statistically analyze which way the market's about to move and to jump ahead of that trade before anyone else can do that. Um, the advantage that they have is that they're incredibly quick and that they, you know, they're programmed by very, very smart people that are able to. Uh, deduce you know st statistical likelihood incredibly well what they don't have going for them is an ability to really um differentiate between uh, good signals and bad signals if you like so so what nav does is if you can imagine a very basic example whereby um a bunch of sell orders enter the market you know a huge number of sell orders enter the market well it would suggest that the, the price is likely to go down and then you might see the algorithms also start to join the selling in anticipation of a of an inevitable market fall. And that's you know, obviously a very basic example, but um, that's you know to, to be fair, like Nav's algorithm wasn't hugely more complicated than that, at least at first. So what Nav did is he started to to fire orders into the market that would cause algorithms to react cause other participants to react and then he would trade around that and then he would cancel his, his orders before they could ever be hit so he was basically you know deceiving the market about supply and demand um and you're right i mean in the, in the days of the pits essentially all you had is uh, you know a, a buy and a sell price whereas what electronic trading introduced is that you could see prices all the way up the ladder so you could see the current best buy and the current best offer but you could also see all of the offers waiting um in the queue you know so that it might you know a stock might be trading at a dollar there'll be a load of uh, people that say that they're willing to sell stock for one dollar ten and they'll be waiting in the market and if you can you know pass that information effectively you can get a sense of whether the market's likely to go up or down um one of the things that i found really fascinating in doing the book is that despite the apparent sophistication of, of these H of T firms, despite their huge profits and the, the, you know, the caliber of the people they hired, that they were so easily fooled yeah. um, by Nav's machine that essentially, you know, he, he basically built this machine that would fire orders like three or four or five price points above the current best offer. So far enough away that it wasn't likely to be hit and he would just fire such huge orders that it really sort of changed the scale and, and without fail, at least at first, the, the, the kind of um, the H of T firms and others would respond to that. Um, so it wasn't like, you know, four dimensional chess. It really was pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and we can talk about that. But, he, you know, he did he did over time adapt the algorithm to become a bit more sophisticated and to try and um, you know, keep up with the advances of HFT, but it never really got to, to a hugely complicated form. Well, and it what's fascinating is he was able to build this algorithm at such a low cost. I mean, he wound up paying, what, $20,000 uh, to have it custom designed for him on a mm -hmm. readily available software tool that pretty much any trader could get access to. Yeah, I mean, the first incarnation of this thing, he, he had a... a, a basic software package with trading technologies and he wrote to the guy at trading technologies and they came and they installed it for him for free they didn't even ask what he was you know what it, what this feature that he wanted that was going to fire and then cancel orders would would be for and then later on as he kind of wanted to modify it and get a bit more control 
yeah, he wrote to a, a software guy in, in Chicago and, and I, you're right. I think they agreed on $25,000 and, uh, you know, I think Nav then catched him out of <laughs> a few grand. So the guy never really got, you know, even got what was agreed. Um, did that guy ever monetize that with other, but, you know, without to, yeah. did he ever monetize it with other customers? I mean, it, it seemed like, you, you know, this, this tool, pretty much anybody could use this tool to do what Nav did. Yeah, so, so that's almost like a subplot of the book. So he gets in touch with this guy called Jitesh Thakar, and he asks him, he gives him quite a detailed blueprint for this, essentially a spoofing machine that is going to place orders and then cancel them once other things are happening in the market. Uh, and it was very effective. It meant that those orders that were spoof orders really very, very rarely got hit. But it's you know, pretty basic, and the guy had it up and running within a few months. At the time, um, the wording of their contracts was such that the software developer was going to be able to market it and sell it to other people. Uh, but that came back to bite him quite badly because um, not, you know, meaning to sort of spoiler alert the story, but after Nav ends up getting arrested, he then gives evidence against this guy and the software developer ends up um, being charged for aiding and abetting spoofing. And it was a fascinating case because it was really about whether as a third party software developer, as a vendor, how much responsibility you have for what your customer goes on to do with your your product. And in this case, as you say, the guy made $20,000 and probably spent six months on it. And Nav made, you know, sometimes several million dollars in a single day. Um, and ultimately, Jitesh was, uh, was found, well, the case was actually thrown out. So he was never uh, criminally prosecuted for it. Um, but yes, I think, you, you know, you would do well to think twice in the future about just asking, asking questions really about, well, yeah, what you might want to, <laughs> what, what this guy might want to use it for. Well, either, either that or don't ask questions, right? One or the other. Well, I think that was the problem that he didn't ask the question. And the, the whole point was that he was quite a sophisticated and experienced market practitioner that he, he was on some committee of the CFTC. Mm. So the whole argument was like, you yeah. know, anyone who's been in this market for any time would have known what it was for. Well, um, but you're right. He did the, the evidence wasn't there. So. Now you point out that, you know, the practice of spoofing is, is something that's been around for as long as we've had markets. I mean, you, you pointed to how Daniel Defoe described this behavior, uh, 250 years ago. Um, and so there have been customs, there have been laws, there have been rules that have emerged in markets to try to mandate some form of uh of transparency or authenticity to minimize the likelihood of spoofing so why is it that 250 years later um the cftc didn't have in place any kind of real binding legal rules that would um that would make this impossible or difficult yeah so so that was an interesting kind of adjunct to the story, which is about the, the genesis of the manipulation and the spoofing rules. Um, I mean, as, as we kind of already touched on, spoofing just wasn't as much of an issue um, until the real, really the birth of, of electronic trading. And I think it took a while for it to become uh, as pervasive as, as it did. Um, and, you know, there, there was the, the passing of the Dodd-Frank rules you know, it was going, going through and, and, you know, in my interviews with the regulators, they sort of talk about how these big pieces of legislation are almost like an opportunity to like hang on other kind of things that you might have on your wish list that haven't really got anything to do with the overarching theme of Dodd-Frank. So in this case, uh, the CFTC has got this kind of woeful record at prosecuting market manipulation. Like it, it literally has won one case at trial or it had until fairly recently. Um, and the reason for that is because the market manipulation rules are such that, you know, it's such a high bar to demonstrate that somebody's actually um, manipulated the market that they all, they would even not bring cases or when they did, they would lose them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the fundamental issues is that you have to demonstrate intent. So not only do you have to sort of have the data that shows that you traded in, in a way that looks like you were trying to hammer the close or manipulate the market or whatever it was, but you have to have some kind of evidence that you meant to do it and that you succeeded in doing it. 
there's not even enough that you know that, that you meant to do it but you have to demonstrate that the price was different than it otherwise would have been so it's such an onerous onerous thing so when dodd frank was passing the um you know the kind of regulator that the cftc saw an opportunity to issue more specific laws so you could just define spoofing as placing an order that you don't that you intend to cancel um and they sort of define banging the close at that point in time so the regulators saw this as i guess an opportunity to to redress the balance and to be able to bring these kind of manipulation cases and i think uh, um, an outsider would look at this and say um navarro was a scapegoat um you know he's not someone with a big legal team he's not somebody with uh um counsel that can protect him from putting incriminating evidence into uh into emails and so forth and that um you know he's the tip of an iceberg and that there are large scale practitioners who would be engaging in these practices who who are um escaping any kind of uh accountability um to, to what extent is that true um that he's a really a scapegoat that he's an easy person to pick on that that he's kind of uh a distraction from what's really going on in the markets so, yeah so i think it's you know it, inevitably it's, it's complicated like with nav you can easily be deceived by the fact that he wore a tracksuit and lived in his parents house but he he was make no mistake the biggest uh market manipulator ever in the futures market you know over a period of 400 days he spoofed the market to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars every single day um and on the you know on the day of the flash crash he made a million dollars um so there's a couple of questions. One, one is, um, you know, was he unfairly prosecuted for cheating the market? Well, I would argue no. The evidence is pretty clear that he set out to spook the market and he did do that. But what really landed him in trouble, and that, you know, is, is definitely a, open for debate, is what impact he actually had on the day of the flash crash. Um, and so, you know, the flash crash itself, just a quick recap, is May 6, 2010. And it was a pretty volatile period in financial markets anyway. Uh, the markets have been sort of uh, tumbling throughout the day. It was the Eurozone crisis. And then at 1.41 p.m. exactly, suddenly the markets fell off a cliff. Uh, and you had both um, uh, S&P futures and individual stocks crashing, you know, in a way that and it, at a velocity they never had before or since. Um, a trillion dollars was, was sort of wiped off the markets in a space of five minutes. Um, and there was a kind of post-mortem after that, you know, everyone was kind of hand wringing about well, what does this mean and, and, and is this going to happen again? And one of the interesting things is that even though the FCC and the CFTC did this big report, they didn't identify manipulation at all as a potential factor, let alone identify NAV. Um, and there was also uh, another actor that day, which is this, and you may have taught this in your class, but is this, is this uh, pension fund called Waddell and Reed from Kansas City that just so happened to enact a huge $4 billion sell order, um, you know, because they were concerned about the movement of the market, but they did it in such a way that there was no uh, kind of limit on the price that they were willing to accept. So that order entered the market almost concurrently with the price crashing. But there was other things like there were technical issues at, at some of the exchanges. There was a lot of HFT that was there providing liquidity that the, the sort of left. Um, and so, you know, Nav was was spoofing that day. That much is certain. He made a million dollars. Um, but the question is, did he help cause the crash? And, and that is definitely still a matter of, of controversy. Even now, you know, you I think, you know, if you speak to the Justice Department, they'll argue, you know, in a financial market, it's impossible to kind of extricate one actor from another but the fact is that he was acting very recklessly in spoofing the market lower on this day when all this other stuff was happening so you can't you can't say that he didn't contribute to it um but there's been some academic studies that have looked at trading on a millisecond by millisecond basis and they say it would have happened anyway and to blame it on this guy is, is ludicrous so I, you know a long-winded way of saying i i think that nav was very unfortunate that he happened to turn his computer on that day because otherwise a he would never have caught the attention of this whistleblower guy and b even if he had got caught he probably would have got away with 
you know, maybe a fine and a ban from trading as opposed to 22 criminal counts of, of you know, wire fraud, which is what happened. What I find also interesting is that it took so long for him to be identified and there was a massive investigation of the flash crash and a, and a long report and uh, there was no mention of him. Um, and uh, and so just as you mentioned, the, the large uh, hedge funds and, and high frequency traders were unaware of him. So too were the, um, the authorities. And uh, I think you had a quote in there that while the traders are, you know, riding motorcycles, the uh, authorities are, are riding mopeds. Um, is, is that just a, a structural problem uh, that, that the regulators are always behind? I think when, when we look back to uh, what happened in, in 2007 and 2008, I think, you know, the SEC was clearly kind of uh, under, under weaponized and, and with Bernie Madoff, um, you know, he was not detected by any authorities. He was detected by a competitor who, who had, um, yeah. Uh, difficulty replicating the trades. And then when he notified, uh, you know, Harry Macropolis, when he notified the SEC, the SEC kind of blew him off. Um, why did it take yes. this guy, Mr. X, to to actually uh, identify him uh, rather than the authorities? Yeah. So, so, yeah, so what essentially happens is that there's this immediate investigation into the flash crash everyone's up in arms this event's really kind of destabilizing and everyone's wondering if it's going to happen again and then everyone's talking about oh let's regulate the markets a bit let's find out what algorithms people are using and try and be a bit more uh, have a bit more scrutiny and then gradually you know I, the attention span of politicians turns on to something else and everyone forgets about it um, and then in 2012, another guy uh, who's trading essentially for his own account is uh, sort of back testing some software that he's built. And he decides to back test it on the day of the flash crash because that was such a eventful day. So he wants to see if his software is effective, at, um, uh, you know, software that allows him to visualize what's happening in the market. So he just turns it on on May 6, 2010, and he sees that there's all these hundred million blocks of sell orders entering and then cancel you know being cancelled in the market um and you know he's an experienced trader it takes him a while but eventually he comes to the conclusion that uh, this must be manipulation and he's one of the very first people to apply to the uh, the, the new whistleblower program which is like the paid whistleblower program that came in with dodd frank um but you're absolutely right the the incredible thing is that he doesn't have access to who's trading. All he can see is like orders entering anonymously into the market, which is publicly available information. And yet you have the CFTC and the SEC that both apparently did this deep dive using, uh, you know, full data as to who exactly was doing what. And, and it, it completely eluded them. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the idea of spoofing wasn't well understood. Spoofing depends on people placing and cancelling orders. And what a lot of the original investigation was based on was the actual orders that were consummated. So, so that was one thing. But like a bigger answer to your question, I think, and it's something that comes up a lot in my reporting, is that the first line of defence for cheating in financial markets or certainly in futures markets is supposed to be the exchange. Mm -hmm. So the CME is a self-regulatory organisation or authority, and that means that it has a, a supervisory function. It's supposed to monitor what's going on in its markets and identify when people are doing things wrong. But the problem is the CME is also one of the most profitable companies in America. It thrives on high frequency trading and the volume of trading that goes on. It's not good for business to turn around and say, our markets are vulnerable to abuse and manipulation. And so ultimately in this case, you have the CME failing to identify uh, what was pretty obvious to this guy uh, was going on that day. Uh, and, and it's not the first time, you know, uh, we can maybe get to it, but there's another story I've recently worked on, which is uh, about what happened in the oil market on the day that it went negative. And a similar kind of stories there where you have the CME turning around and saying the markets behaved perfectly. Um, and when it was pretty obvious that they didn't. So I think that that's a real problem with the current market structure in, in the US. But on the other hand, the commodities markets are dominated by, you know, the big boys. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to get a lot of um, support around the idea of protecting Citadel, whereas protecting kind of the retail investor in the stock market is something that everybody can kind of get around. 
Um, is there is there yes. a difference between the way the uh, SEC treats the stock market and the way the CFTC deals with the commodity markets in that respect? Um, more of a kind of a hands off. I mean, yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. There is, but 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 that's not what it like the it's not what it's supposed to to be so there's a sort of practical reason why it's developed that way which is that the cftc is hugely underfunded and it's typically mostly staffed by very bright but lawyers not technicians not finance folk um and so essentially they are quite dependent on the exchange to alert them to what's going on in the market and you know there's that analogy to you know to a ferrari and a moped or whatever well that's getting you know further and further away you know as as, as more and more the citadels of the world invest in in uh technology the budget of the cftc doesn't doesn't increase um and i think you're absolutely right like there is a difference in the sense that commodities markets and futures are peopled by professionals but ultimately they also determine the prices of commodities that affect you know you and me that are buying oil or uh cocoa or you, you know gold or wh whatever you, you know that, that has real world economic impact um but certainly the sec has an added responsibility particularly as we're seeing in the moment with kind of robin hood and stuff whereby essentially anyone can uh can gamble in the stock market more easily um and yeah and, and there's a kind of added added responsibility there um and the SEC, you know, as a result of that, it, it has got considerably more funding than the CFTC. It's it's a story where it's kind of hard to easily sort people into the, you know, good guys and bad guys. I mean, I think, you know, Jessica Harris, the folks in the uh, CFTC, they, they come across as, you know, the good guys, but they're, they're almost like a, a sideshow. And, and I found that um, there was some delicious irony here in that um, uh, Nav made his first big score uh, trading against Jerome Curviel, who's uh, who is a crook, and then he wound up losing all of his money uh, in in a bunch of Ponzi schemes. Uh, and so, you know, it was he made his money from yes. from a crook initially, and then lost all his money to a, to to a crook. Um, the second story I found particularly interesting, and, and a potential uh, another book for you. Uh, tell us a bit about um, Jesus Garcia and and what you learned about him and more importantly you know what you learned about that whole world of of tax shelters and um you know scams i mean they say a fool and his money are soon soon parted and and you know nav as brilliant as he was with respect to um the video game like environment of the markets he, he wasn't a very good reader of uh of of people in in the flesh and he certainly couldn't see through the yeah. kind of con artist of, of this guy, Jesus. Yeah. So, um, one of the just bizarre things about the whole story is that Nav never spent any of the money. He would just accumulate money, more and more money. And he, he sort of took this decision early on that he wasn't going to tell his family about it. And he wasn't going to tell his friends about it. Um, you know, he's got quite a simple life in, Hounslow lives with his parents. His mum and dad are on his case about finding a wife and settling down. He plays football with his mates. He drives a, a bike. What did they think? He, what did they think he McDonald's. was doing? What did they think he was doing all day? <laughs> I mean, when he was arrested, his dad was interviewed and he said, "I don't know anything about computers. Don't ask me." Um, so you know, they didn't know. I think you know, maybe they had an idea that he was trading, but I think you know, Nav had always been a little bit hard work and maybe it was just you know best not to ask he's upstairs doing his thing um and so yeah the, the, the i think one of the things that makes him so sympathetic as a character is that yes he's doing this thing in the market he believes he's justified because he's taking on the hts but at some point his accountant notices that he's making a huge amount of money and says hey nav do you want to meet my friends you know these guys can really help you with your money um and so he gets introduced to uh, like a cast of uh, increasingly <laughs> colorful, um, you know, slash crooked investment advisors who glom on to the fact that this is like the ultimate 
mark because he's got money flooding in and he doesn't spend it and he'll believe whatever you tell him so you know he he at first he invests like 15 million pounds in wind farms in scotland he's never been to scotland he doesn't know anything about wind farms but they tell him that this is a great sort of tax opportunity and if he puts in 15 million it'll be 250 million in three years so that's the first thing he does and then once he does that he gets introduced to another guy who uh yeah as you say is called uh, jesus who's this kind of mexican guy who presents himself as a as an entrepreneur uh, and he basically says, you know, my family are one of the biggest agricultural families in South America and essentially, you know, gets Nav involved in, in some other scheme. And, you know, all he has to really do is tell tell Nav that there's a 12 percent interest rate. And Nav is pretty, you know, pretty greedy. He's like, my bank has only given me three percent. This guy says he can give me 12 percent. He's met. He meets him twice. And then he writes a check for forty five million dollars. Um, do you think that um, his, this sort of tra- yeah. do you think that you know he found these stories believable because um his story is so unbelievable and yet true that he thinks that um there must be other people out there who have uh, magic gifts like like his um and and that's why he's not skeptical like an ordinary person would be well i i think you know the first thing you've got to say is that he was ultimately diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Um, so he, you know, has these amazing gifts in one sense, but he also sees the world in quite a black and white way. So that you can see that throughout everything he does. Like, he's like, looks at the market, sees other people spoofing, they don't get in trouble. So he's like, I'm gonna spoof. And it doesn't occur to him that, well, he could get in trouble himself. He's kind of, that's his decision and he's gonna stick to it. Um, and I think, you know, with these guys, they seem friendly enough they kind of courted him and would sort of take him, you know, it was this kind of great scene where they take him to Goldman Sachs and he sort of sits there in a tracksuit slurping a coffee uh, and they sort of take him to Switzerland and show him the high life, if you like, and he just totally, totally buys it. Um, but the other side of it, I think, and this is me, you know, pop psychology, but I think for Nav, if he could not spend the money and if he could let other people make these decisions, then it almost wasn't real for him. It was like he could keep it separate. He had his little life in Hounslow, and then he had, you know, all these investments and stuff, and he didn't really have that much to do with it. He would just entrust it to somebody else. He never spent the money. He never told his parents. And so he managed to kind of compartmentalize those aspects of his life. And that's why I think when the FBI come knocking on the door, it's just such a, uh, you know, a huge shock to him because he just didn't, didn't anticipate that. So that means he also probably didn't miss the money once he lost it, but he probably missed the uh, the life that he had and and the uh, and the thrill of the, of the trading which he had to give up. Yeah, definitely. You know, the story starts in Nav's bedroom and it ends in Nav's bedroom. You know, he essentially uh, ends up being kind of sent back and 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 is sentenced to to house arrest and and yeah there's this kind of circularity to the whole story um and you're absolutely right like you know of, of all the people to lose their their entire savings he's probably amongst the best um he's is 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 actually quite good timing because he's just been released as of last week so <laughs> if you can imagine i've actually received emails from my hft firm saying can you put this in touch with now because we'd love to have a conversation yeah it'd be interesting to see if you can so if you, get work in a normal environment um in your other book right i mean tom hayes yeah. is, is a figure that is the kind of dominant player in this book and you know he's also been diagnosed with with asperger's and uh they have they have a lot of similarities in terms of their um their personalities, you know, they're sort of, uh, abrasive, um, folks don't really sometimes know how to get along with people. Uh, but you know, he was not given the same, uh, leeway as, as NAV ultimately, uh, by the, by the legal system. Um, do you think, do you see similarities between these, these two characters and, and maybe just remind us, you know, what, what Hayes uh, did, uh, that you describe yeah. in this book? Yeah, so, so The Fix tells the story of the LIBOR scandal, and it sort of tells it principally through this character of Tom Hayes, who, 
again, is good timing because he was released from prison last week. Um, but he became like the ultimate uh, figure of the libel scandal and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. Uh, was actually sentenced to 14 years, reduced to 11. So he, he uh, as you rightly point out, didn't get any of the leniency that NAV ultimately got. Um, you know, just to sort of recap, the libel scandal was this big scandal whereby uh, it turned out that representatives from some of the world's largest banks were um, lying about their borrowing costs on a daily basis that went into this figure called LIBOR in order to make more profits on their trading books. But it was having this kind of huge impact because LIBOR was baked into all these kind of contracts and mortgages around the world. Um, and it became a really big deal at the time because it was after the financial crisis. So, you know, the world blew up, nobody got prosecuted, everyone was disgusted with bankers, there was kind of, you know, Occupy movement, um, and banker bashing, certainly over in this country, was just really rife. You had Bob Diamond, like, pilloried in front of, you know, politicians and losing his job. Um, and then, you know, it, it kind of emerges that, uh, that these traders are essentially offering to give each other bottles of champagne in order to lie about their interest rates, despite the fact that it impacts $350 trillion of security, um, which really just seemed to encapsulate everything that was wrong with the financial system, really. It's all, it's so almost, it's just, almost seems more yeah. wrong that they're doing it for a bottle of champagne than they're doing it for, yes. you know, $40, 50000000 million, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the thing about Hayes is that there was this flaw in the system whereby LIBOR was set by, you know, either 12 or 16 banks and they would all put in a number and then the average came out. And the thing was, they would all have uh, these big derivatives books and wherever the number came out on certain days would affect their profitability. And lots and lots of people were lying about their borrowing costs to try and make a tiny bonus on their, you know, they might make $50,000 more or something like that. What Hayes did is he kind of industrialized that process he realized that a lot of the people that set LIBOR relied on speaking to third party brokers to know where to put the number. They'd phone their broker in the morning and say, hey, where's three month dollar LIBOR today? And so what Hayes did is he started going to the brokers and saying, if you tell everyone that it's higher today, I'll you know, give you a $100,000 deal, I'll buy you lunch next time or, or whatever it was. Um, and so he kind of, his genius and his flaw was that he, he found a way to take this flaw in the system, which which everyone was uh, was utilizing, and take it to a whole nother level. And was very very successful. Um, but ultimately, he got caught, like lots of other people. Um, I mean, like, one yeah, w one thing I would say about the Hayes case is that there's a huge amount of sympathy towards him because everyone says that he's the scapegoat for libel. Whereas I'm not sure I quite by that and I, it's an unpopular view but the thing is that he, he throughout and I, I sort of referenced in the book but he was given warnings essentially that this was not allowed and he essentially ignored those warnings and then at the end he decides to confess everything and so there's tapes and tapes and tapes of where he's saying yes i did this and this is why i did it and yes it was deceptive but everyone did it and my boss is new and all that and then after that process he has this kind of very pig-headed which is very nav like change of, of heart where he's like no screw that this is unfair and he changes his mind so the sfo um uh you know as it was in the uk had all this evidence of him confessing that he knew that this was wrong and that he did it anyway and yet he was now pleading guilty so i went to trial and they threw the book at him um i certainly feel incredibly sorry for him but i also feel like that was just such a stupid decision um and he would have probably got you know a couple of years if he'd stuck to his guilty plea um, but yes, both him and Nav do share this kind of anti-authoritarian, kind of arrogant streak um, that lands them in a hell of a lot of trouble. The, the, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the LIBOR scandal is is so fascinating to me because you know at universities like mine, we teach in financial engineering classes, uh, you know, how to price swaps and so forth, and you know, we have very, very complicated models and we throw a ton of firepower at it and we, we, we have a ton of software and, and, uh, you know, hire PhDs and pay them a lot of money and, and do, do some very sophisticated stuff. But the entire edifice is just built on a couple 
guys going out for beers, you know, like, I mean, when, when, when you, when yeah. you realized the, the, the yeah. massive pyramid, the, the trillions of dollars yeah. of, of notional principle and on, on out there, yeah. um, that, you know, dwarfs the entire size of the global economy. And the whole thing is, is teetering on this, this little number that's determined by a bunch of folks making phone calls. Um, I think most participants yeah. don't know that if you, if you interviewed, uh, maybe now they do, but if you interviewed people 10 years ago and said, Hey, how is LIBOR determined? I don't think most people knew what the British banking association was. I don't think most people in academia or in, in practice, you know, knew that it was a, it was based on a survey and not based on actual lending data. I mean, uh, and so when it came to the surface, it's, it's, I think, I think a lot of people were just super surprised that it's a human story. Yes. You know, and, and that was almost lo like so much in finance. It's like a historical anomaly whereby the original libel was invented for the purposes of one deal, you yeah. know, decades ago. And at the time there was really no such thing as derivatives. You know, this was for it to price a loan and then it got used to kind of price structured notes and, and then the derivatives market blows up and the original inventors of, of LIBOR and the BBA, to be fair to them, you know, were unaware of where it was going to go, but nobody turned around and said, hey, you know, maybe we should have a think about how this thing's actually actually determined. But I would say that that's a, a theme in, in all of the stories that I write about markets is this kind of idea that there's the kind of veneer of complexity and science and respectability and underneath it there's chaos <laughs> and you have these kind of opportunities for people to cheat and you know systems that are so complicated there's always ways around them and traders are highly incentivized to find those um and you know, it's just consistently amazing to me how exactly like you say with LIBOR, how actually, you know, people with, with enough motivation are able to to cheat the system um, because they know more as practitioners than, than anyone else. Well, I, I don't think we could end this interview without talking about current events. Um, the, the whole Robin Hood um, fiasco, um, okay. I actually just read uh, a couple of days ago that the the folks in Notting Hood, Nottingwood Forest who are <laughs> the Robin Hood uh, support society is getting <laughs> all sorts of grief <laughs> by, uh, by Twitter yeah. and, and so forth by accident. But, but, you know, this whole story, the whole narrative of GameStop and AMC has been set up as, as one of class warfare as of the little guy yes. going up against the big, uh, soulless uh, hedge funds, um, which I find absolutely fascinating, especially because, you know, we all know how the movie ends <laughs> and it's the little yeah. guy that gets crushed in the end. Um, but, but at least for a few moments, a few fleeting moments, it looked like the, uh, the folks with the pitchforks were, were able to stick it to the, to the big hedge funds. Uh, do we, this, this seems to be a, a narrative that, that pops up from time to time in, in financial markets. Yeah, definitely. And, and I can't criticize it because that's essentially why I think Nav's story resonated so much. It's the idea that he's the little guy taking on the, you know, David taking on Goliath and succeeding and ultimately getting taken down. Um, I think inevitably with the Robin Hood thing, you know, from, from what I, I know and from what I've read, which is, you know, no more than, than is, is out there, inevitably the, the situation is more complicated than that. It seems like there are some on that Reddit forum that made a lot of money mm -hmm. and lots of people that didn't make any money. And actually maybe they're quite sophisticated, the people that made a lot of money. Uh, like the main guy, I believe is like a, a sort of investment professional or at least was. Um, and ultimately, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if trading data showed that there were, you know, establishment hedge fund players that were, either jumping on the back of or exacerbating the moves, you know, and made more money than, than the Robin Hood traders did at all. Um, so I think it's appealing, but I think ultimately it's, 
it's definitely simplistic. Um, but what I do find fascinating is just how the government and the regulators are going to be able to grapple with this. Because it seems like, like we were talking about earlier, the manipulation laws might not be fit for purpose. You know, if you all go on a forum and say, hey, I think this dog of a company is really great. And everyone else goes on and says, yeah, I agree with you. Why don't we buy it? Is that manipulating the market? I'm not sure it is at the moment. Um, and, you know, as far as I know, the numbers of uh, forum members on this on this Reddit forum have like doubled. Mm -hmm. So you have this swarm of retail <laughs> traders that you can imagine like going from stock to stock like locusts. Um, so it's going to be really fascinating to, to see how the government responds to that and whether that was it, whether it was a one off because of the circumstances of that one stock or that two stocks or whether this is something that we're going to see going forward. Yeah. And that's, what you think. And that's sort of the, uh, why there was so much support for the free nav uh, hashtag was this, uh, seeing him as little guy. I mean, I think that, look, these were super small cap stocks that, that were being, um, gyrated all over the place. And, and uh, although there will be plenty of people who will lose money, plenty of widows and orphans and, and, you know, young gamers who will lose money. Um, it's kind of small potatoes compared to what, um, the e-mini is right. And, uh, and so yeah. I think that while it probably will raise some, some investigative hackles, uh, as long as it's limited to the small caps, uh, I, I don't think it's going to cause any kind of massive regulatory intervention. Um, but you can see already the folks at Robin Hood are concerned, you know, they don't want to lose their, uh, golden goose. Um, and if, uh, if there are some regulations imposed on them, uh, and on these forums, then they're going to see a loss of business. So I think they're taking an interest in kind of toning down the gamification that they use to try and, uh, make sure that they avoid any kind of regulatory oversight. But that could be your next yeah, book, right? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, you know, you're not the only one to have suggested that, but that story just became so big. You know, I, my publisher wrote me an email saying, if you can get a, a proposal together in the next two days, I think I can get you a good deal. Uh, and then the next day, there was an announcement that Ben Mizraki, you know, already sold the movie rights to, you know, to the book. So I think everyone had the same idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, the thing about the nav story, it, it just was so rich because he always argued that the system was unfair. And, and when he was arrested, it was so shortly after the Michael Lewis book talking about mm -hmm. the HFT techniques and the kind of idea that the markets were rigged, that it, it wasn't like superimposed after the event. Like he genuinely believed that he was fighting against this kind of corrupt system. And um, I think with Robin Hood, to me, it's more anarchic than that it, and um yeah how you how you go about kind of creating a narrative out of that as well i i don't i don't know but i'll be intrigued to see what they do with it yeah they'll they'll no doubt be a bunch of little side stories that will come out of that main story just like they did with your books liam this has been fantastic uh i really appreciate you coming in today um and i want to remind everybody to check out both of these books um flash crash super interesting and the fix you'll learn a lot about uh commodity trading you'll learn a lot about derivatives you'll learn a lot about the sociology of of uh of the markets uh and um and there's some fantastic psychological portraits in there and uh great writing so appreciate it liam keep up the good work awesome thank you greg appreciate it this is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.